Right, well, I think we're about ready to start. Uh, hello and thank you for coming. Um, my name is Rich Metzen. I'm one of the developers in a team called Semeopus, and we make a game called Off Grid. Um, and this is a talk about how you can make a moddable hacking game such as Off Grid uh, and use it as a tool for digital activism. And more generally, how making your games that are about important themes making them moddable will actually open it up to experts gravitating towards your game and sharing their expertise within that community and helping you to um, explore the far reaches of your subject in a way that you wouldn't have been able to on your own. So, without further ado, this session will cover uh, why allowing your players to tell the sto their stories in a dialogue with you as the developer is more powerful than you telling your story to them in a diatribe. What systems are important to open up to modding? So a kind of a little bit of a top down on the design decisions that you maybe need to consider as you choose to make your game moddable. How to give players compelling tools for discussion of a complex subject. So a little bit of a kind of tech overview of, uh, of what we did uh, in order to create a moddable video game, uh, especially within a small uh, restricted indie team of, of five people and how to reflect an issue with the appropriate depth by involving yourself in the theme or culture you are exploring. So I'll talk a little bit about how you can do this in generic terms, and I'll use examples of how us being involved directly in hacker community and, and culture around data privacy and advocacy and activism has all fed back into making a more interesting game. I'll just move this so that my ums and ahs don't quite pop in the same way. I assume you can still all hear me fine. So, what is off-grid is, I guess, the first question, because this has got a bit of a case study as to how we've done it. Well, off-grid is a moddable stealth hacking game where essentially you manipulate data and the data that characters leave behind in order to engineer the AI off of their path. So you're essentially blackmailing the other characters in the game in order to make your way through it. And you do this by hacking Internet of Things devices around the, around the game. Um, I'll just pop on the trailer quickly so that you can get an impression of it here. So, have we got audio? There we go. Power is being taken away from the edge and concentrated in the center. We're going to throw down governments that hurt people, that tear out their fingernails, that destroy them. We're going to carpet bomb the net with freedom. So in Off Grid, you play as a hacktivist, uh, sorry, you play as a technophobe dad who's got no experience with technology and relies heavily on his daughter who's a, a real technology savvy type. Uh, she's a teenager, she's a little bit out of control and she is basically a hacktivist in the background without you knowing. Um, she gets taken away one morning uh, by the security services and it turns out all of her friends have been raided at the same time and you as this person who's got no understanding of it have to stumble into the world of hacking and hacker culture in order to work out what's gone on. The game itself revolves around hacking into different vulnerable devices in order to acquire data and one of the interesting things that we did kind of early on in the game, uh, about two and a bit years ago, was make uh, the game scriptable in Lua so that it was in a, a, an easily digestible language for newcomers to coding, um, at least more easy than C Sharp. And also it separated the gameplay from the core logic of the systems, which means that you can then make what's called an API, a set of calls that players can use to trigger different objectives or particle effects uh, or whatever else that you expose. So I'll explain a little bit more about that. But first, I'll explain the basic premise for the game. We actually started prototyping off-grid before 
uh, Edward Snowden came out with his first leaks. And I remember the days when we first started trying to tell people about the idea of making a game about data privacy, and people would be like, what's a data? Um, it was completely out of most people's vocabulary. The idea of mass surveillance was a, a new uh, kind of term when Edward Snowden came about, and, and we all take that for granted now. But it's something that's kind of public knowledge. And the game was set in a, a kind of slightly ridiculous universe where essentially uh, there was a, a, a powerful uh, prime minister type who had decided that for the safety of everyone she would lock the internet down. Uh, and, and sadly that then it turned out to happen because it, it, since then we've had uh, Mrs May become our prime minister and not only that she's put forward the digital economies bill which is essentially a way of outlawing all encryption in the UK. Um, on top of that, we then also had this idea that in order to show the pervasiveness of data and how ridiculous the internet is becoming, uh, every single device in the game world could be an internet of things or a smart connected device. Uh, and we started prototyping this again in 2013, and it got to the point where we thought that people um, might think it was slightly unrealistic, it was slightly too out there, and then lo and behold, a couple of years later, the universe caught up with us, and we had to put all those ideas back into the game, and it became a central mechanic. So um, if we're busy predicting things and it's our fault, I'm, I'm really sorry, because we're painting a bad picture for the world. Um, so essentially, the, the notion of the game is you play this technophobe dad who is guided by some hacktivists, uh, through different buildings in order to try and find documents that pertain to some form of conspiracy that your daughter's been wrapped up in. So you have to get into a building, you have to then profile the people who live in that, uh, or not, will live or work in that building. So in, in this instance, it's a newspaper office in our demo level um, where you have to profile the guards and their likes and behavior by collecting the data that they leave around. You then have to hack into different devices that are either badly configured or have easy passwords to guess or have some kind of puzzle relating to the character that you've profiled in order to get them to open up. And so in this instance, you can go to the cola machine and you can download all of the discount vouchers for the cola machine and find a guard that's a, a fan of Coca-Cola and spam him with the ads and he'll go and use the Coke, Coke machine. Um, and you can then make him drink too much so that he then needs to use the bathroom. And the bathroom, of course, is a smart bathroom, so the guard has to wash his hands. The bathroom registers whether he has or hasn't, and you've already hacked the soap dispenser so he can't clean his hands so the bathroom doesn't let him out. So the whole game is about kind of manipulating the environment in order to keep your enemies out of your way. It's kind of a pen is mightier than a sword kind of principle. And uh, we wanted this to, to be the case. We wanted there to be kind of no uh, kind of combat core to the game. We wanted it to be that you needed to outwit your enemies, partly because you play as a pacifist normal person. You know, Most of us don't go around buildings clubbing people over the head, but if we were put in an interesting situation where we needed to get hold of some information for one of our loved ones, we would pri probably try and steal it. I'm not sure we'd commit murder on the way. So then you get to some sensitive documents or a server room. You gain access uh, to that data and you download it, and then you have to go and get to the rooftop and put up a mesh network node, which is like, um, it's the idea of building your own internet. So a little Raspberry Pi computer with an antenna with some free software on that you leak the documents out over. So the, the name of the game is get in, get on the networks, manipulate the people out the way, get some sensitive documents to give you clues, and then leak them over the new internet that you're trying to help build. And of course, don't get caught. So, dialogue, not diatribe. That, this is what, what the principle of this talk is about, with all that background. So, it's our opinion as developers that actually one of the core things about games that makes it very different to many other mediums is the direct contact that you have with your players and the amount that they can feed back into the stories you're telling and the knowledge they bring with them. This is um, something that a lot of people in uh, larger games over the last couple of decades have been making use of in terms of making sure that experts fed back into what they were making. And Civ 4 was a really good example when Civ 4 became moddable. Um, so many more interesting things got layered into that game. 
And then more recently, smaller teams have been doing that to uh, an absolute bombshell. So uh, for instance, if you make a game that's moddable, my premise is that it will make gra uh, experts in that field gravitate towards it. And a great example is actually Kerbal Space Program, whereby they made an interesting space game, but because it was moddable, actually astrophysicists then came in and told them, oh, well, that's not exactly how a slingshot works around a planet, but I've actually done a mod to model the gravity differently, and this is how you would do it, or this is how something breaks up in orbit. And you get a dialogue between the players and the developers um, that becomes about creating authenticity and exploring a subject together. Uh, and that has happened also with games like City Skylines, where the idea of urban planning actually becomes something that's explored by people whose profession it is. Um, and the games expand in a way that a small or even a large team would find it very hard to without an absolute fleet of um, uh, consultants or resources that most of the time aren't on hand. In our case, we've made a hacking game that has had hackers and security experts gravitate towards it. So we have friends um, in these different parts of uh, InfoSec and the hacking culture. So Hacker Fantastic, for instance, is a well-known uh, security researcher who uh, has taken an interest and, and uh, likes to feedback on the things that he'd like to see in the game and, and, and help us um, get our message out to, to people who know more than we do. Jake Davis was uh, uh, an ex-founder of LulSec who, if you know about Anonymous, Lulsec were a splinter group who uh, got themselves in a lot of trouble for uh, breaking into the Sun's website and putting a story on the front page that said that Biggie and Tubac were alive and well living in New Zealand. But they also had some activist roots. They stumbled across um, a, a company called HB Gary, um, and in um, a kind of bit of a beef that they had with the owner of that company, uh, they found that he was trying to work with Citibank and the CIA in order to seed WikiLeaks with false stories so they could then point them out as being fake news to discredit WikiLeaks. So they stumbled across a conspiracy where it turned out that a national uh, governmental institution and a major financial institution were working to essentially silence journalism in, in the US. Um, so he's an interesting character. And Biela Coleman, who is an anthropologist who studies digital culture um, as if uh, you would when you were, uh, if you were an anthropologist in a tribe. So um, the, the general principle with anthropology is you go and live and breathe and, and exist within that community, and then you report on it from the ground level perspective. And, and she did this in a digital manner on IRC during some of Anonymous's biggest operations, um, like um, Optunisia, um, PayPal, all of those kinds of things that we probably all heard stories of in the kind of 2011, 2013 period. Uh, and so then on top of that, you get people just gravitate towards you who do know more than you do, just full stop. They don't necessarily need to be famous people, they need to be people passionate about the subject. And so our, um, our Discord is full of people talking about come for the story and concept, stay for the mods, uh, coming up with new ideas, uh, and, and just championing us in different ways. So your message can be exaggerated much faster if you allow people into the game. We've had people make their own little memes about the game, things like that. Um, but we're getting more into, and the reason for being to, here to talk about it, the notion that actually people can talk about the things that really matter to them. So this is a couple of uh, Turkish YouTubers who um, made a video about off-grid before there was um, very much out there, actually, um, when Erdogan uh, decided to ban YouTube. And all of the, the Turkish YouTubers and, and gamers actually almost overnight lost, a, lost their living. And so the idea of data privacy and censorship became a very important subject matter to them. So in this instance, these guys actually watched our trailer three times in a row and had a discussion about the importance of it in the modern world and, and how it impacted them. And making a game moddable not only allows people to tell their own stories in that way, but it, in our instance, it allows people to localize to a language that you can't necessarily afford to. So that game and its interesting politics or theme can then spread to communities who would not be able to have access um, to it if it was just you as the developer in charge of that stuff. Um, we've also had our uh, Discord basically 
jump to our rescue when we've had people come in and, and act as antagonists. So in hacker culture, there is a term skid, which means script kiddy, and it's a derogatory term for people who don't really know much about hacking. And someone came into our Discord server and just decided to try and throw insults around and very quickly quite a lot of the people in the Discord put them right and told them why they were wrong and, and asked them a bunch of questions, diffused the situation on a Sunday night when I was playing with my child and having my dinner. So, uh, you know, if you make a game that people feel that they can take away something from and get invested in um, from the get-go, you're going to have that kind of camaraderie occur very early. Um, and that kind of is evidenced here, and I've never seen um, a game that isn't just full of PR crap and, uh, you know, making it so community-based. Um, so how do you reflect an issue with depth? Well, my premise is you involve yourself in the culture you're exploring. Now, in hacker culture, it's kind of quite obvious there are conferences dedicated to that culture. There, it's its own subculture. Obviously, not every game that you make can be about a culture, but if you drill into it, actually most elements of uh, the game you're making have some kind of cultural reference that you can spend time uh, learning about as part of your process. In our case, being involved with the guys um, from Lulsec and um, uh, from going to conferences like Shah, still hacking anyway, which is a, a Dutch hacker camp, um, has, has really made a big difference to us. Um, so they have both advised us and pointed us in the right direction, corrected us, and, and helped us generally just make the game uh, explore that kind of culture with some authenticity. So where do you start if you're going to try and make your game moddable? Well, I believe you should ask four questions. They're kind of design questions, so let's have a go. Can you teach a beginner to mod your game? So, if you're going to make your game moddable, what are the simplest things you could make moddable? Uh, and generally speaking, that means being able to test uh, someone just changing a couple of lines uh, in the text of your game. So, if you're telling a story that has some dialogue, just open up the data sheet that you're using for listing all that dialogue to players so they can write their own conversations in. We then went further and we made uh, easily accessible tools so that players could up upload their mods and, and build things more rapidly. Can an expert in the field explore it in a depth that keeps them entertained? So do you have some deeper systems, like I was saying about uh, the astrophysicist who came to Kerbal Space Program? Have you thought about an element that is A, easy at the beginning, and B, has some uh, rewarding depth uh, that an expert can actually tweak and tune, something that is about the core principle or the core mechanic of, of the theme you're exploring, whether that be war or science or uh, hacking? Here's a good example. So this is a friend who works in uh, security, decided to, um, in the previous one, put some real shellcode in one of the files that you delivered. Shellcode is, is what's generally used to exploit a, a device in order to, to get a backdoor to it. Um, and he made a, kind of a, a silly pseudo cryptocurrency that he could send between a vending machine and a character in order to purchase things. Um, then can a group of complete strangers learn to use the tools with your guidance? So um, you want to be thinking about how are you going to communicate this tool set to people? Um, and our best way actually was trial and error. We, we went to mainly hacker conferences to start with and ran workshops uh, with friends and with people that we knew and then expanding it out to a wider public of people who were definitely going to get the game straight away. And we used that process to then start to build up documentation so that people could work out how, um, how to learn it off on their own. Uh, and that's when this comes in. So can the wider internet learn to use your tools with just your documentation? So we now run a Discord and we have a wiki. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about how to make your game moddable, our wiki at wiki.offgridthegame.com uh, actually has loads of documentation on the process as well as our dev blog. And then we're running a Kickstarter actually that's currently on um, in order to get the modding community in, so getting early adopters in a, you know, a good period before release, helping you make things, helping you refine your tools. So this is the more design spec side of it. What systems are important to open up to modding? 
Well, control over narrative is really important. The thing that you can deliver people a sense of uh, creativity and craft and shaping something with very quickly is narrative. Um, in our game, uh, the player actually has conversations with the hacker who's guiding them through this kind of app system. Uh, and so I'll just launch this in the background so I can show you a little bit of it um, just quickly. This will take a second to load, hopefully not too long. But so um, essentially giving the player the ability to tell their own story through dialogue or through some form of um, text-based uh, interaction system is a very quick way to allow a player to shape that narrative. So let's um, hit load and jump over there and I'll show you a little example of that. This loading screen is uh, completely false, by the way. It has loaded everything. It's just waiting and thinking, uh, which if you've ever used Unity, you'll find out about. <laughs> it, it's doing something, I promise. And So I guess the other thing to kind of mention, which I'll go into in more depth, um, when we get to the kind of technical side of uh, how this stuff works. I just realized I haven't plugged my laptop in, which is why this is taking longer to, uh, to load up than it should. Let me just do that. Um, is by exposing the text in the game in a language that's easy to digest. So you, you can usually do that with something like Lua or XML, something that's a data type. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. There we go. So, in our game, all of this is a, these modals are essentially path, paths and text files that you can set up to tell, teach the player dialogue in different ways. Um, so here's an example of just setting up some story, or you might try, try to tutorialize things um, in a level that you've created by putting new text in. We'll skip through this just a second. Then. As I was saying, Off-Grid is kind of a third-person hacking game where you're guided by this character who is a hacker, and he's set up your glasses to be able to see data on different networks. Um, the next thing in terms of allowing players to control the narrative is this kind of dialogue system that we have. And this is essentially, again, an open set of scripts in the root of the streaming assets folder in the game that people can just tweak that if you have a copy of the game, you can go into those files, you can just tweak the text, and you can make your own branching conversations. Um, and these conversations are functions in their own right, so you can then trigger other events in the world, whether that's objectives, or hackable devices behaving in a certain way, or spawning new characters, or changes in the story. But essentially, you start to give players, by giving them the narrative to toy with, you start to give them options for triggering more interesting things down the road. So we'll skip through this. Because the other thing that we've allowed people to do in terms of shaping the narrative is um, there are files and inventories that you pick up as a character as you run through the game. So in this instance, he's just said that he's going to send you some files. This explains how that happens. Um, and in here, we have um, the iOS manual, uh, which is a, that's, that's your control set that he's sent to you, but also something that fits more into the fiction of the game, which is like uh, the dash man text for the software that you're using. So you can then read through all the background of the app system that you have as a character. And, and we actually modded this as an interesting way um, for uh, a campaign group called Big Brother Watch in the UK. So we were asked by uh, Mozilla to attend a thing called Privacy Lab in London, which was um, a debate over the Digital Economies Bill, which I mentioned earlier, which was essentially uh, meant to be a trade bill, but it ended up uh, attempting to outlaw encryption that wasn't certified by the government, which essentially means not really encryption. Um, Anyway, what we did was we put all of the people that were going to be in the panel into the game as characters, as virtual characters that would have conversations with us while we ran, ran around and demoed. And it, it surprised the heck out of all of the people in the audience. And then I sp scraped the website of um, one of the um, people talking, and I pushed that into a text file like this so that their 
guide to privacy was a file that the character could get sent to them. So fair, fairly quickly, you can start to see how just opening up some text files for people to edit, you can start to allow for players to tell advocacy, advocacy stories quite quickly, uh, and, and especially advocacy groups. If they have documentation that is dry that they want to deliver to people to read through, you can drip feed it in documents that people have to hack and find uh, around the world. And if, if your game was about something else uh, in a different lore or universe, Universe, that's still a really good way to find codecs or to find scrolls that actually deliver some content that relates to your real world um, uh, message. So, let's drop back out of this. That's how you deal with narrative. Um, so, control over a core mechanic. So, in our instance, this is apps creation, but it can mean um, also a a weapon or a tool in your game, you, you need to give players the ability to mod agency in that world. Um, so in our instance, the main mechanics revolve around this set of apps in the bottom left hand corner of, uh, of the screen, uh, and the fact that your character has the ability to read the data around the world. So in this instance, we have um, this data utility, which allows us to read the data in front of us. Uh, David, you were asleep again in that building there. Uh, all of these apps are written in Lua. So essentially, if you can create a structure in your game that you want to make moddable, where people can define the strength of a weapon or what effect it has on the world, and it doesn't have to be a weapon, because I use the term weapon loosely in a game design sense, because that's the trope that most people use. And, and in some sense, we've avoided with the idea of apps, and they don't actually have a direct impact on someone's health, but they have a direct impact on someone's behavior in off-grid. So being able to affect these kinds of things is important um, for allowing a, uh, a modder um, to tell a story. So you know, uh, giving an item uh, that, that explores your political subject to a player in a certain way. So, and control over a core obstacle or puzzle system. So, in our case, that's hackable devices. Um, in off-grid, it's a hacking game, you hack stuff. Uh, essentially, there are all kinds of slightly nutty hackable devices around the world. As I said, at the, at the minute we can see like a CCTV um, array there. We've got Dave's phone on the desk. Um, there's an ID card. We'll just scan this ID card and get through to something more interesting. Um, but essentially, because you've built something that's moddable that allows for people to control conversations or to con trigger different so instances in the game, game. The that guy's going to talk over the top of me. Turn that down a touch. It's cool. Kind of nice sound, so we keep some of it in the background. Um, so uh, giving, giving players control over some of the puzzles or obstacles is the next thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm giving a pretty top-down idea of kind of how you mod the entire game, but it just really does break down into four categories along these lines. So in our instance, um, all the devices you, you get exposed to are hackable devices in varying ways depending on what data you've collected on which characters. So uh, for instance, if you can collect enough data on a character that pertains to the fact that he's messaged his wife saying, hey honey, is my favorite blue shirt at home? I think I might have forgotten it. Um, did you feed Jimmy the hamster this morning? And um, uh, can't wait to uh, get back for our anniversary today. Those three pieces of data are sensitive information that can help you crack the password of someone because it pertains to the context of how someone might construct a password. Um, or you just find an IoT device that's been badly configured, which is usually the case. So in this case, we can actually SSH into this hand dryer that texts us uh, uh, an advert asking us to like them on Facebook because we're on the same network as it because it texted us from walking in there. Um, and from in there, we can download all the user logs. So we get all the data on each of the guards that are in this building. And then we change the system information to turn it on to continuous test mode because we've actually been told that the best way through here is uh, through the bathroom. There's an air vent. And as you can see here, although we couldn't hack into the thermostat, the hand dryer being on means that the temp ambient temperature in the room goes up, which means that we get a nice little stealth trope where the, uh, the air vent opens up, which uh, if you like stealth games, then you like crawling through vents, generally speaking. 
So that's what's going on here. Uh, we'll just run through here to a slightly safer area and I'll show you a little bit more. But essentially those hackable devices are our puzzle system. They're the things that gate characters' pro progression uh, uh, and then they're also the things that affect other characters in the world by getting hold of their data. Um, that's not what I want to do. And so then the fourth thing is control over the metagame. So being able to script an entire mission. You don't want to throw this at your players immediately. That's going to be overbearing, especially in a game like Off Grid, where you have to define all the hackable devices and you have control over the characters and, and whatever else. But actually, I'll show you a little bit in, a, in not too long about how we've constructed our entire mission script to kind of look a little bit like a movie script. You define the characters who are coming into the game, you then define um, their objectives, uh, and you define the things they can interact with, and then there's a, a sort of almost a chronology to how uh, the player will interact with that. But um, more importantly, being able to set objectives in the world, set progression, and in our case, actually the ability to dump a moddable level straight into the core game so that your players and modders can actually expand upon things that they think you missed. They can either change the levels you've built, or they can add a new b level in between level two and level three because they think you missed a point here and actually hammering home something with a different level that explored it in more detail is important. Or, of course, in our case, the ability to branch a level off and then go on a tangent exploring that subject and then come back some other time later. Um, and I don't have much of an example in the current demo to show you, but essentially we have a, a level selection map screen that grows as you add more buildings and, and create new networks. So players will be able to download multiple mods that they can see in the one map and see how that universe is expanding based on what mods they're interested in. So that's quite a complex thing, but that's the last thing that you can try and look at it, look, in, look into doing if you want to make your game moddable. And then you can go further. Uh, it's, it's actually really surprising how quickly opening some of those systems up opens up ideas that you thought were really big things that you can do in a nice, neat way. So character creation. We actually um, we realized quite early on that if we changed how the characters were um, were skinned uh, or textured, we could create a color lookup table so that people could just edit a single file with the color swatch swatches on and essentially make their own custom characters. Um, procedural generation elements. If you have any procedural generation in your video game, then actually one of the things that you can do is open that up by putting it on the moddable side. In our instance, all of the text messages that you see the uh, guards generating as they walk around the building are actually generated based on their personalities. So um, if I switch around here to the data utility and I'll throw on data delete as well, I can start to try and download um, some of these files and I'll start to build up, oh this guy's chatting to me, I'll just finish this conversation, sorry, how rude of me, shouldn't be on my phone. <laughs> um, so as I've kind of gone through this level, I've started downloading and erasing some of the data around me. And that actually builds um, the profile along with the uh, user data. We've now got some of the favorite colors, um, favorite swears, exclamations they use, whether they've washed their hands or not. And this guy, his favorite drink. So we know that he's going to be using the coffee machine more than often, um, uh, more often than not. And, and in that instance, we can go and get the adverts from the coffee machine. Uh, we can change the coffee to only serve decaf. We can turn the radio down to classical FM and turn the lights to an ambient hue. And then you can actually make the guards fall asleep or you can do the opposite, put the rock music on, double the caffeine on the coffee and make them play air guitar. So essentially by changing the environment in our game, you change the behavior of the characters. Um, and that can all be done through kind of the procedural generation element that we've given people the access to. And like I mentioned at the same time, you give access to those things and all of the text files, then localization becomes something that as long as your UI has been built with localization in mind, you can give players the ability to do themselves. So once you make those files accessible, the possibility space really opens up incredibly for how you can give over control to your players to have that discussion with you. So here's a little bit of a background on how we went about this. So we, um, we make off-grid in Unity. Lots of developers use Unity now. Um, but one of the interesting things about Unity is actually that it's, um, it's downloadable for free to anyone who wants to use it. 
And it's a, a level editor that is far better than any level editor we as a small team would have been able to build and provide to our players and modders anyway. So we decided, why not skip that process and build a, a set of tools within Unity so that players can download essentially our level designer's full tool set and then start to make their own levels using the kind of construction pieces we've set up for them. Um, so an example of how you can then pass that over as kind of a, uh, a route into something more activist or a route into something that explores the just the, the conversation in more depth than you could have as a, a, a developer, regardless of whether it's politically themed or just more historical realism. In our case, we're making a hacking game, right? Well, there is a security researcher called Scott Helm in the UK. I saw him give a talk on the Nissan Leaf. He, he owned one of these electric cars by Nissan. Um, and he was curious as a security researcher as to whether he could get into his car through the app, the fact that it, it was connected to the internet. And uh, sadly, he found out fairly quickly that he could. Um, he started out by trying to prod at the fact that the car had a SIM card in it, so it's on GSM, and it spoke to a server. And, and luckily, that stuff was locked down. Um, but as you'll often find with any kind of provider that is, uh, their main product is something else and they make a companion app, the app was where the problem was. And he decided to try and intercept the communication between his electric car's app and the server. Uh, and I'll try not to use too many buzzwords here, but essentially, he used a, a tool called Burp Suite, which is an, uses SSL stripping to de-encrypt the message from the app to the server. And the result was this JSON string. So game developers uh, actually use JSON fairly regularly for save systems and whatever else. Again, kind of like Lua, it's a tabled system. Uh, it passes data, uh, and, and it's a, a good way of actually being able to see in games uh, what the state of something is. And, and it turns out that's the same for electric cars. So he found that he could strip the SSL and he saw this message that was uh, battery status, whether it's no done normal charging, what its capacity is, the plug-in state, what its cruising range is, um, the date. But also, he started to find things like um, the location of the car, uh, whether it was locked or unlocked, and whether the lights were on or off. Um, and he, he wondered, oh, well, interesting. I wonder how this is authenticating. You know, this is my car, so obviously my app is going to send the correct authentication to the server to, to allow me to see this data. Um, but uh, he's, he started dropping all of the data out of this JSON table. So he started dropping the fact that it was sending its location. He then dropped the fact that it was sending um, uh, the mileage of the car. Um, and he got down to the point where he then dropped the username from it as well, and it didn't require that. He got to the point where he only needed to send one piece of data from the app to the server, uh, and that was something called the VIN number, which is a vehicle identification number. Um, I may have skipped over something. You see this windscreen here in the bottom right-hand corner? That's a VIN number. It's legally displayed on your dash. So the one piece of data that was used to authenticate any car made by Nissan Leaf, or any Nissan Leaf, um, was a piece of publicly legally publicly displayed information, which means that anyone could walk up to a Nissan Leaf, write down the number, and if they knew the target server, as this guy did from essentially looking at the web request, they could send that number to the server, and it would return the username. Uh, and the username, uh, usually when you register a car with your car dealer, is going to be something like your email address or your real name, because you're not going to use a pretend name to register your car. Uh, so he got people's real names, he got people's email addresses through just this one piece of public data. He could then use that information to get back um, uh, a, uh, a whole set of things. So he could get the battery charging status, he could get uh, how you could um, access the car by unlocking it, things along those lines. And this seemed like a perfect example of exactly how um, uh, you could take a, a real-life mod and make it in off-grid. It took him 
Uh, and, and this is the case with most security researchers. It's a gray area. It took him six months to get anyone to pay attention. Nissan ignored him. And it was only when he got a, t a, a story in a, a national newspaper called The Telegraph, eventually, that they patched the app. So all these people who owned that car were vulnerable. Um, and along these lines, uh, this happens quite regularly. And it's, a, it's, it's such a gray area that lots of security researchers get sued or jailed for trying to point out flaws that uh, expose users. In this instance, the VIM number, um, the vehicle identification number, actually it's like a serial number, it comes off of a factory line, which means that if you add one every time you put uh, a new VIN number in, so if you increment it in programming terms, you actually get the entire factory line. So he, he actually managed to track every location of, of the Nissan Leaf in the UK. Um, so it's a pretty bad thing, you know, and this is something that probably Nissan should be paying attention to when someone raises a concern. And my premise was, I, I went to a hacker conference and I said, well, if no one's listening to you, why not make it a mod in a video game and let people play it, and then there'll be some news that, that generates from somewhere else and people can explore the effects of the thing you've found, and you can help educate the public as to um, the dangers that they may be faced with different devices, or devices that are badly configured. So in this instance, we, uh, we have, if I find the videos quickly, um, this car hack. So that's OBS. In this instance, it's a kind of prototype level that's set in a car park. The player is told to try and discover a, a, a car by its license plate belonging to a staff member. Uh, in this instance, actually, you're in um, you're in a harbour, so it's one of the harbour workers. It's a high security area. Um, you know the license plate of, of the owner of the car. You essentially go and find the car and find the VIM number on the uh, on the windscreen. Um, in this instance the player attempts to try and hack into the car like we saw with the hand dryers before, um, but it's not accessible. They then scan the VIN number in the windscreen, and they can then send that data to the car, and it returns the username, and they use that data to log into the car. And, and, and in this example, when you log into the car, it gives you control over the animation of the doors so that you unlock the car, the lights inside it so that you can uh, see what you're doing, and the alarm system so that you can use it to distract uh, the security guard away from um, the uh, barrier so that you can then sneak on through into the harbor and do whatever the thing that you need to do in the harbor is. Um, so we just use this as a, a sort of fun, quick example, but, but the interesting thing with making your game moddable is these stories can actually be, deli be delivered quite quickly. So this mod was made in, a, uh, I think, about, about half a day, if I remember. It was less than a day. Um, and if you think about it that way, actually, it means that your players um, get the opportunity to experience things in near real time. So if an interesting or important piece of news comes out about the subject you're exploring in your game and you've made it moddable, then that piece of news can be in your game as something that people can share and explore and discuss together almost faster than it can get into the newspapers. Um, and that, that's quite an exciting premise, and it doesn't have to be a hacking game that we're talking about here. It can be any type of news. It can be any game subject matter. That's for you guys as developers, designers, players, potential modders, to decide. Um, so, I, uh, I don't know how technical to go. I think um, a, a friend actually uh, pointed out yesterday that this conference is kind of geared much more towards a design mentality, so I don't want to bore you all to tears with the intricacies of Lua. Um, but here are some examples, and this is how the car VIN was defined. It, this, this piece up here, uh, that kind of roughly, I don't know, it's not even 10 lines, um, is defining the VIN number and the piece of data you need to collect to auth into the device. Um, on the right-hand side, it sets up that as an objective. And then um, down in the bottom, 
is uh, the uh, basic definition for the onboard computer. So, you know, we're talking about 20 lines of code here. Uh, and that's what it creates. It creates the interface, um, and these are the uh, pieces of data that are listed in it, the battery charge status, the user ID, the trip ID, the travel distance. All of these pieces of data can then roll into different mechanics. And this gets kind of slightly madder, because you can then start to use, in our instance, the game to model the world in more interesting and intricate ways. So the hand dryers that you hack in the game that I showed you earlier, um, they're pretty simple, but there are real-life systems that have backends that look very similar. As you can see, some of it may look a little like it's kind of pseudo-hacking in off-grid, but it is based on these kind of end curses backends that exist on most hackable devices. Most things have a maintenance mode that can be accessed. Um, uh, like, there's a famous one about um, uh, the Coca-Cola machines that have... Um, LEDs sort of displays on them. If you work out which buttons represent one, two, three, four, and press them in the right order, you can get a free Coke and go into maintenance mode. That's a real thing. These things exist on the devices all around us, even before they were on the internet. Uh, and this leads to hacking ideas, like how crazy can your audience take it? Probably crazier than you can. If your game is historical and wants to explore the depth of um, spells and potions that um, genuine cultures within uh, a, a, a recent history or empire used, then they're going to dig into that lore far, in far more depth than you are as a developer and come up with interesting things. In our case, those potions are the magic of hacking. Uh, and we have loads of references on the internet for this. There is something called the Internet of Shit. It's a Twitter feed and a blog. It essentially points out all of the most terrible uh, Internet of Things ideas ever created. Um, and so a lot, I've come up with kind of a, a design principle that is take, take either a digital thing and an IoT device or two badly thought out IoT devices and combine them and you have a hackable device in off-grid. So in this instance, IoT air fresheners where you can spawn uh, 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 a Jokemon that the characters like to collect next to it, they go and collect the, the Jokemon and uh, it sprays the air freshener in their face. They have to then go and wash their face to, to get it out of their eyes and they can't see you in the process. Um, Talking gloves and pelvic floral tra uh, training trousers for men. Um, I, I haven't worked out how that one will work. Someone probably will. And this one, someone's already made. This is a manufacturer who's come up with a smart water bottle that is a premium water bottle, a health tracker, well, hey, connected to the internet, a virtual pet game, and love and care. Keep yourself hydrated, look after your little animal, uh, and, and have all your health data connected on the internet to a really badly secured device. Um, this is a genuine product, and, and I'm sure it's you know, probably lots of fun for people who use it, but it's probably badly configured. So we also made a version of that in the game. You have your little pet here who you can feed, um, but also you can begin a DDoS attack with him. And this is, like I said about the smart bathrooms, rent -a kill who make rat traps actually make the same system reconfigured for tracking whether employees have washed their hands. So rat trap system maps to an employee tracking system by the same company. Um, and if you get these two wires crossed, you could end up with some fairly hilarious results. But you could also teach people a little bit about how they are usually tracked at work. People are not often that conscious of the fact that their employers probably track their finer movements um, in, in ways that are slightly creepy, as certainly in bigger employers. So how do I actually do this? Well, um, like I said, we've actually got a blog that will help you through some of this stuff. Um, it, we essentially download, uh, you download Unity and our tool set through Steam. You then have loads of geometry that means that you can make something simple or something massively complex. You have these pre-built pieces of geometry to do that. Uh, you inc we include components that you can mark up as mission objects or hackable objects or triggers or spawns. Um, and then you have this Lua script that's like a, a, a movie script that can take you through the characters, the objectives, the items, etc. Um, I will sort of skip through this uh, a little bit because um, it's the sort of thing that I can explain in more depth in a, another talk that we have online uh, that you can check out or on our blog. But essentially, you then set up the initial state of the player, who they are, 
You set up these mission objects, doors, triggers, interactions. You set up the hackable devices as I, I sort of went through earlier. And then we've got it all documented on an I, a public API. So p players have control in any aspect of the game, any trigger they can create. They can control the AI, the animators, the conversations, the devices, the doors, the particles, the sound, the UI, and the networks. And actually, this was written, um, this little screenshot was taken quite a while ago. That has ex expanded significantly since. Um, and then there's the documentation of the API and how, to, how players can use it. So uh, you kind of make a game out of modding your game. You, you make it uh, accessible in nice little bite-sized chunks so that players can actually go, well, I'd like to tell my own story. Where do I start? Here's a nice little, little bit for you to try. Um, and then you kind of can make tools that make it easier. So we've got Atom snippets that auto-complete the scripts for people. Um, as I mentioned, we're on Kickstarter. If you're interested in the project, um, please do find us on offgridthegame.com slash Kickstarter. Uh, there is a free demo of the game on the Kickstarter, so that's the most important thing for you guys. If you, if you want to explore what we're making, then go there and, and get a, get a uh, copy of the demo. It's, it's still kind of a very pre-alpha complex build, um, but you get an idea of all the principles in it. Um, and so we've got time for just a few questions. So uh, if you don't have any right now, you can tweet at Rich Metzen or at Off Grid the Game. Um, I think we've got a few minutes, but not very many. So uh, yes, Alexander. Um, do you have any plans or means to filter the content? Because players are players, and we tend to get a lot of like swastikas in, in the custom content? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, there will always people be people drawing willies and, uh, and things like that. Um, it, it's, it's a tricky one. Uh, I think you kind of have some tools within the workshop that are kind of publicly floated um, good mods and good ideas. Um, we will also have a menu in the game that actually curates our favorite ones. Um, uh, but I, I'm not sure we want to completely filter out other people's content, especially not when you're talking about making a hacker game. You're right, like, um, like Svastika's turning up in the game would be quite disturbing for me, personally. Um, uh, but actually, the way that some of the hacking groups in the world work is to shock people around an idea. I'm not condoning it at all, uh, but the idea that I would step in and stop uh, content from being put up is policing it in a way that isn't necessarily um, something that I necessarily would know how to do or could do effectively. You kind of have to hope that the good content floats to the surface and the stuff that's just terrible and bad ideas disappears. Um, that's how our approach will possibly be, but also at the same time, I'm willing to take advice from developers who've done stuff like this before and can help me come up with ways to make sure that um, the most interesting content becomes available and the stuff that's offensive for its own sake is uh, forgotten about, if not completely filtered out. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, that that's so hard. Okay. Um, my question is, if you want to find like inspiration for like different hacking and so on, because if you you can mod this mm -hmm. game, so I was wondering, do you have any advice where you can find like real life inspiration or real life stories about? different hacking and so on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's in the news all the time uh, nowadays, but if you want something that's in more detail, that explores some of the, the possibilities within that kind of world. Actually, most hacker conferences are very similar to games conferences, and they film the talks. Uh, so you can go and watch like uh, DEF CON or SHA or uh, CCC. Um, uh, uh, you can find them on YouTube, and, and there are often people exploring um, whether it's how to hack a Game Boy or um, how to uh, exploit your yeah hand dry, uh, hair dryer or um, you know uh, that there's there's quite a lot of YouTube resources out there for for exploring that kind of thing and that hopefully inspires interesting mods. Yeah. 
I've probably got time for one more question if anyone has one. Be brave. There we go. Yep. Uh, I came a bit late, yeah. uh, so I didn't hear everything in the beginning. Is there a story-driven game, or is it all in smaller sections? It is story-driven. So there is this core story uh, where you play as a technophobe dad whose daughter is a hacktivist who, unbeknownst to you, she's been up to some shenanigans, and she gets bundled away, and you have to learn how to hack by going through different locations uh, in order to find data on her case. So there is a core kind of story that you meander through to gain an insight into the universe. And the idea with making it moddable is to allow that to be expanded upon by the players. So uh, it's not a pure sandbox. There is a core experience, but there's a sandboxy element where the mods allow it to expand over. OK, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Well, thanks very much. Um, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>